tackling climate change, limiting global warming, reducing the release of greenhouse gas emissions on the one hand, and increasing carbon sinks to capture and store the emissions that are already in the atmosphere. Carbon neutrality, net zero, carbon credits, Paris Agreement, carbon offsets, and more and more. All of that falls under the doctrine of decarbonization, which is our attempt to purge ourselves of environmental sins, metaphorically speaking. We have nominated greenhouse gas emissions, mainly carbon dioxide, to be the worst singular offender. And we want to get rid of it as much as possible, from as many areas of our life as possible, right? From the energy sector, from manufacturing, from mining, from food, from agriculture, from construction, from everything, right? From fossil fuel energy to renewable energy, from petrol cars to electric cars, from steaks and cheeses to plant-based foods, right? In other words, from high carbon goods, services and activities to low carbon goods, services and activities. All of that is under the doctrine of decarbonization. It's like a giant, massive, green decarbonization train, right? That is roaring, that is gaining momentum. But by the side of the tracks of this train, there are biodiverse rich bushes that are copying it and that are often destroyed in the name of decarbonization. For example, when we reach for these minerals that are underneath primary rainforests, we get the minerals, we clear the forest, because we need the minerals for green transition, right? For electric batteries, car batteries, and for wind turbines. Or when we replace biodiverse rich mixed forests with a singular mass planted standardized carbon farms. So in this video, we will look at what makes this strain of decarbonization so strong and what makes biodiversity so weak. If we lose biodiversity, there is no point of focusing on decarbonization in the first place. Biodiversity is as important as reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Hi. I'm Jan from sustainablebutterflies.com.au. Uh, there are five pillars of sustainability, as you can see on my screen. And in this video, we're continuing our exploration, our journey through the fleshing out the concept of the green invisible hand. Uh, I won't go into what it is and why it's happening, because we already explained that. That's all been fleshed out before. So if you missed that, have a look at the previous videos slash articles. You'll find them on my YouTube channel and the articles on my blog, which is linked in the video description. Okay, so what makes decarbonization so strong and powerful? Well, it, there are four things. Number one, it has one clear and concrete goal, and that is limiting global warming by reducing the release of greenhouse gas emissions. The second thing that makes decarbonization so much stronger is it has clear targets, right? Temperature, we must limit global warming to 1.5 degrees, and time frame, right? The IPCC tells us that in order to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees, we must peak the release of greenhouse gas emissions by 2025, then we must halve it by 2030, and consequently reach net zero by 2050. You probably heard uh, various net zero targets and pledges, such as net zero by 2045, net zero by 2050. Some countries have it as law, other countries have it as policy. Australia doesn't have legislated net zero target, but we finally have legislated as law a emission reduction target of 43% by 2030. The third thing that makes decarbonization so strong is its clear metric. Uh, temperature, obviously, that's degrees Celsius. And greenhouse gas emissions, it's tons of CO2 or tons of CO2 equivalent. We have technology for measuring these greenhouse gas emissions. And we also have accounting frameworks. The most common is the greenhouse gas protocol. And these frameworks we use for categorizing the sources of emissions, 
such as from petrol cars, from power plants, from cement, from steel manufacturing, from clothing, from everything. And we group them as scope 1, scope 2 and scope 3 emissions. And the fourth thing that makes decarbonization train so strong and gaining momentum is that it's universal, it's global, right? We have 198 signatories of the Paris Agreement and they clearly understand that one goal with one target, with one metric, that's what we need to do. Yes, we have our own individual pathway how to do it, but it all falls under this quiet single goal, right? So all of these four points, right? The first one, one clear and concrete goal. Number two was clear target. Number three, clear metric. And number four, it's universality and global application. That's why that train of decarbonization is gaining momentum and is so strong and so it's just pushing and pushing, right? Now, we need to contrast this train of decarbonization with biodiversity. Because biodiversity doesn't have one universal single goal. It doesn't have one universal single target. It doesn't have one universal single metric. And it's not global, right? It's rather the opposite. It's localized to particular biodiverse region in a particular country. Unlike carbon dioxide, which you, you release, in regardless where you are in the world and then you store it, uh, capture and store it regardless where you are in the world. It's just calculation of up and down and what's balanced, that's the, the whole net zero principle. But with biodiversity, it's much more trickier, but yet biodiversity underpins everything. Now, I'm going to give uh, credit for this distinction between climate change and biodiversity because it's not my idea. I actually learned this from uh, a PhD conservation researcher at the University of Queensland. Her name is Natasha Cadenhead. And I attended her presentation at last year's land care conference. So I learned it from her, full disclosure. Natasha Cadenhead, if you want to contact her, the link to her LinkedIn profile is in the video description. Now, why is biodiversity so important, right? Well, if you are into the environment and if you care about these things, you recognize and understand the intrinsic value of nature, such as uh, there are, there's rich coral reef, there is diversity of all organisms in the world, in the forest, in, in, a, in a landscape, in, in even your garden, right? There are indigenous communities that benefit from it. There is plenty of fish in the river and it's all beautiful and natural. But there is intrinsic value of nature. So while I love that, we got to recognize that that's not how most people think. And unfortunately, right, so rather than intrinsic value of nature, let's focus on the instrumental of value of nature, which means what does nature do for us and what does it do for us, meaning, well, for example, food, right, because farmers need crops and these crops must be pollinated, right, and the pollinators, they need biodiversity. Without biodiversity, there are no pollinators to pollinate the crops that then farmers can sell. Therefore, farmers, they depend on biodiversity directly. Now, let me just share with you a few numbers and I'm going to read them because I don't remember them, obviously. So, and again, I learned this from Natasha. So, more than half of the global GDP of 44 US trillion depends on ecosystem services, and that means biodiversity. These services underpin financial performance of businesses. For example, losing pollinators would translate into 500 billion US dollars worth of uh, crop value gone. Wow, so biodiversity really is a big deal, right? So in this video, I wanted to share two key points. So one point was to draw the distinction between biodiversity and climate change. So that was one. And the second is to offer potential pathways, right? Way forward uh, scenarios. One of these scenarios is that biodiversity will become embedded into decarbonization. There might be some change of how we look at 
this whole climate change mitigation process and there might be some new framework and we will be accounting for biodiversity under the decarbonization. The other scenario is that the biodiversity will gain prominence on its own, so separately from this decarbonization train, right? Maybe we will have things like, well, biodiversity credits, biodiversity targets. Uh, biodiversity markets, like we have carbon credits and carbon markets, that kind of thing, right? And the third possible scenario is that biodiversity will remain neglected, right? And we will be just continuing uh, like tunnel vision on reducing carbon dioxide as, as though that's the only thing that matters. And I hope that we won't see that third scenario. Now, how are you going to enhance biodiversity at your early childhood service, school or even home on your premises, right? Well, let me introduce you and invite you to my new course, which is called The Jungle Fire. It is a sustainable horticulture course, which shows you how to green up your service, home or outdoor space and school safely, sustainably and on budget. And I would love to see you there. You can register. The course is now pre-launched. So you can register. There is a link in the video description. I'll see you there.